Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to talk to you about the earliest private rocket launch provider, Space Services Incorporated, and their Conestoga rocket. Now, the company was started by a guy called David Hanna Jr., a Houston-based real estate developer, and in the 70s, he'd get interested in commercial space. And at that point, NASA was putting all their effort into the space shuttle, which he kind of realized wasn't really very friendly to people that wanted to launch small payloads cheaply. Now, in moving around in these circles, he met a young wannabe rocket scientist named Gary Hudson, who convinced Hannah that a small, low-cost commercial rocket could actually build, be built without the help of NASA. Now, Gary had never completed college, but he'd learned a lot about space, and he'd consulted with IBM and other major companies on space technology. He had big ideas, like mining asteroids, and he talked about a concept he called tele-tourism, which we would nowadays recognize as virtual reality. A deal was struck and Gary was given $1 million to develop his rocket. Gary put together a team of his friends and set up shop in Sunnyvale. All in all, Gary and his team sound like the epitome of Silicon Valley hackers. They were just building rockets instead of writing software or building computers. They were working together days, nights, and weekends towards a common goal, and they would play hard too with alcohol fueled parties and hot tubs in their Sunnyvale Hills. They were going where no people had gone before without the help of government money. Supposedly, Gary would acquire random pieces of space hardware which he thought might be useful for this project guidance systems from X-15 rocket planes, and he bought a pair of turbo pumps from a Titan rocket from none other than Bob Truax, before later deciding that the rocket he was building would use pressure-fed engines instead for simplicity. The rocket was called the Percheron. It would actually be a cluster of rockets with three boosters and an upper stage able to put the payload into low Earth orbit. Seven boosters would be used for a geostationary transfer orbit. I guess the idea was they would light two boosters, and then after those were ditched, they would light the core booster, and then finally you would have the upper stage. Now, each booster would be 18 meters tall, 1.2 meters in diameter, and burning kerosene and liquid oxygen using a pressure-fed engine. That meant the tanks had to be pretty heavy to contain the pressure. The engine would develop something like 27 tons of thrust. Now, they did some small-scale engine tests at Fremont Airport across the bay, and then built the rocket, shipped it out to a small island near the coast of Texas to test it. Unfortunately, things did not go well. On the first launch attempt, the engine failed to ignite. On the second attempt, the engines overpressurized and the bulkhead separating the fuel and the oxidizer ruptured. Supposedly, the top of the booster ascended to something like 50 meters, driven by the pressure released and the explosion. In the coming months, Hannah changed plans. He decided that solid-fueled rockets would be the way to go for commercial space enterprises, based on conversations with experts, engineers at NASA, and prayers. With high-risk enterprises like Rocketry, it's always good to get as much advice as possible. So Gary Hudson was out. But Gary continued to work on cool space ideas, including the fantastically Kerbal rotary rocket concept, and he's currently the CEO of the Space Studies Institute. But in his place, Hannah recruited Deke Slayton, a member of the original Mercury 7 who had just left NASA. The rocket was to be called the Conestoga 1, named after a style of wagon employed by pioneers crossing North America. Actually, it was really a sounding rocket called the Ares, with a longer payload fairing. And truth be told, the Ares was actually the, the second stage of a Minuteman missile with some extra fins attached for stability. I actually built a simulation of this using Kerbal Space Program with Realism Overhaul, so you can watch that. As it turned out, the real problem in the days before the 1984 Commercial Space Launch Act weren't technical, they were bureaucratic. After getting something like a dozen government approvals, there was still no legal way for the company to buy the rocket they needed. 
But the legal people did some thinking and they figured out that they could legally lease the rocket from NASA and then if the rocket was not returned in perfect working order, they could pay for a replacement, which was what they expected to happen anyway. And in the end, their launch was a success and it carried a test payload on a suborbital trip to 313 kilometers and ended up in the Gulf of Mexico, meaning that they had to of course pay NASA for a replacement. It was the first commercial rocket to reach space. But the next big step would be something that could take payloads into orbit and it took a long time to come together. It would be 1995 before the Conestoga 1620 was ready to fly. Now the 1620 was a code. There were many variants they'd suggested but the 1620 specifically had seven Castor 4 solid rocket motors. These were standardized motors that they could buy. Uh, on top of that, there would be a single Star 48 upper stage. That's the same uh, kind of rocket that was used for the final boost of the Parker Solar Probe. All this together would in theory put 900 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The first stage would light four of the casters. The second stage would ditch those and light two, and the third would have one, and then finally the Star 48 would push the payload into orbit. Again, I managed to clone this in Kerbal Space Program with realism overhaul. The main difference being that I lacked access to the larger altitude optimized nozzles used for the second and third stages. If you look at this photo, you can see that some of the rocket nozzles are wider. Those would be the engines that would be lit further up. But more importantly, the Castor 4 engines that I had available did not have thrust vectoring, so I had to kind of fake that with control surfaces. Again, the launch did not go as planned and the vehicle's guidance system was too aggressive in controlling the vehicle such that it actually ran out of hydraulic fluid to move the nozzles, resulting in a loss of control and the destruction of the vehicle. And with that failure, they abandoned the plans for the other variations on the rocket design and essentially stopped launching their own rockets. But, you know, three launches, one success. That's technically better than SpaceX, who uh, took four launches to get one success. The company does still exist to this day in the form of Celestis. Those are the people that will launch your loved one's ashes into space on a rocket. But instead of flying their own rockets, they're buying launch services from other companies. In fact, they were one of the payloads on the third Falcon 1 flight. Unfortunately, that didn't go so according to plan because after stage one shut down and they staged, stage one still had enough uh, fuel burning in the rockets to push it forward and the stage collided with the upper stage, leading to the loss of the vehicle. Thankfully, of course, SpaceX managed to get their Falcon 1 flying on their next launch. And now, of course, they are what they are today. So anyway, yeah, commercial space vehicles aren't a new thing in any way. It's just that recently they've become reliable and successful. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>